Thank you all for joining this evening. We are so excited to share with you everything we have this evening. Tiara is going to share her amazing story and we are gonna learn from Jana about the amazing space that parents and families have and the importance of meeting families where they are and letting them be the center of attention. So Jana and Tiara, go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much, Melissa. This has been such an honor for me to get to know APH Family Connect and the Family Board, which is really um, my uh, introduction to um, APH and Tiara as a board member of APH2, which we'll introduce when she is ready to tell her story, but thank you. The unique disability of deaf blindness is misunderstood by many. It's a low incidence disability considered the rarest of rare. The diversity of the child's needs and thus the supports and needed services for our students to learn, communicate and thrive is very high. As you'll hear from the expertise of our parent Tiara who will be presenting shortly. The National Center on Deaf Blindness supports our state deaf blind programs with resources, technical assistance, and collaboration within the entire deafblind network. We work to incorporate families and their expertise in their child in all areas of our work. This includes dispelling the myths, fears, and the lack of knowledge about deafblindness in the community. We've learned from our family leaders in the deafblind world that being heard allowed to tell their stories is the best indicator of learning about the whole child. And this in turn informs professionals and brings insight to our families that their knowledge is of great value. Tonight, you'll hear T.R. Jones, a mother of a child that's deaf blind and see for yourself how she has courageously led her family so that her son, Max, can have the opportunities to show all of us that faith in our children and students creates high expectations for all. I wanna step back for a minute to clarify what deafblindness is. And in this slide, we've included the IDEA definition of deafblindness, but to keep it simple, it's a combined loss of vision and hearing of any kind. Let me say this again, deaf blindness is a combined loss of vision and hearing of any kind. 85 or around their percent of the approximately 10,000 students that we have on our deaf blind census have more than one disability um, uh, over and above deaf blindness. And those additional disabilities can mask the critical need to address combined vision and hearing. And this becomes challenging it, for our medical professionals, the educational system, the professionals, and more importantly, it then becomes very challenging for the families. Yet all need to understand that losing any level of combined vision and hearing impacts the child's ability to develop, learn, and grow. Etiologies for deaf blindness can help with this complexity. And I've provided a link here to help determine, this is on our website, to help determine um, what the etiologies are for deaf blindness, where a child um, may have deaf blindness or be at risk. And about 40% of our, our um, children that are considered deaf blind are due to a hereditary or chromosomal syndrome. And you can see the various um, names, odd names, again, because of how rare this disease really is. Usher syndrome, if you've heard of that, charge syndrome are at one of the um, higher number of um, etiologies that we have. In addition to the hereditary is also the prenatal congenital complications or postnatal congenital complications, and they're listed here. So you can see that for as complex as these um, issues are, that deaf blindness can get masked. 
And then we also have um, deaf blindness related to prematurity. So I wanted to make sure that you see that. It's also important for you to know that this there is a state deaf blind program in every state. Under the Office of Special Education Programs, um, they fund each agency under a grant. So when you think about whether your child might be deaf blind or whether or not you have a student that's deaf blind um, and you wanna refer or you wanna be able to get the resources that you need, don't worry about you determining whether or not your child or student is deaf blind, but rather contact your state deaf blind program. And again, there's a link for each state. There's the name of the deaf blind project and you can click on the link to be able to get the right contact information in their website. As I had mentioned in my introduction, Due to the layers of complexity of deaf blindness for our families, we're focusing on our support to state deaf blind programs more and more and our national partners to understand really the high value that we place on family engagement and its importance. Last year, we had approximately 130 families have a voice in the development of a family engagement report that's outlined on our website and the link is in this title. The report outlines the priorities in reaching our families, connecting our families with each other, receiving meaningful resources and developing family empowerment to lead their family and be the voice for other families. And so this is um, an example of where our priorities are that guide our work in family engagement. The first one, most importantly, that we'll talk about even more tonight is to genuinely meet families where they are, to grow connections, to deepen understanding of the unique experience of deaf blindness, to empower families, to strengthen family voice, to provide meaningful and relevant information, and to work toward equity for all families, and to increase family leadership within their home, within the family community, and or with family leadership at a state and national level. Family empowerment is key to bringing the value of family engagement to the forefront. NCDB continues to work faithfully integrating families in all areas of our work. Besides our family engagement initiative, you can see that we have included it in the slide, our other initiatives, and that is uh, for families to be a part of an identification and referral. For the challenges of having qualified personnel in our schools, we need families. And that includes the need for interveners as a profession in the school for our students who need access to information through a human being. And lastly, for successful transition, families need to understand and be heard in the critical years before and after high school graduation. We also believe in taking a family-centered approach, viewing the child in context of the family. I'll be breaking down a visual for you to hopefully understand the compounding complex navigation of systems a family has to navigate and then to reinforce the concept of meeting families where they are in order to begin a relationship of trust and building knowledge about the family strengths and the child. This picture shows the family in the center with circles overlapping the family that's indicated as a triangle. And in each circle is a level of engagement to assess the family in their current capacity to lead, to be engaged. One of the circles is the individual support with primary interaction between providers, ourselves, and then of course with the family. Another circle around the family is family engagement at the community level. Interaction with the school, church, employers, providers, 
um, and, and then community at large. And another level is families capacity to interact with state legislators and at the national policy level. They're all needed and depending on the lived experiences, the opportunities and support system, families can be engaged in all or one or two. Again, we're meeting families where they are, not where we want them to be. This family-centered approach could stop here in terms of explaining what an organization believes in, but it isn't the whole picture. And remember, we want to know the family support system and ability to successfully interact before we can provide relevant and meaning information to the families. So as part of this visual, circling the family are the major support systems that all families need to successfully interact with and lead their family. However, with a family whose child is deafblind and has complex needs, the need to communicate, understand, and work with these systems is at a high escalated complex level. The mom's story, Tiara, that you'll hear, it validates this complicated effort with schools, with the medical system, IDEA and IEPs and expectations of the schools. Again, the medical system that who's often working in an unknown world with such rare disabilities. And then with the financial system where families unspoken struggles to make ends meet is always there. And to understand and work with a system that's like these laws that were set up isn't strong enough to provide for what the laws intended, which leads to laws that are difficult to know and work through for their child. Lastly, the social network, I'll go back to this slide. The social network is a system that includes the culture, language, and background of the family, the extended family, friends, community, church, and spiritual support. It also includes the parent organizations and programs that brings families together. This is what all too often gets put on the back burner by our families due to those stressors and demands of the other systems that I just mentioned. And as professionals, it seems we minimize this um, social network because we've been so trained to identify agencies and family that families are eligible for instead of building up the community. Yet these relationships are equally important to strengthen the family, navigate the systems so that they can effectively lead their family. A family is as strong as its support systems. Now we get to this slide and this adds to the stages of the family that's indicated by a circle around the key systems of families required to navigate. So realize these adult life stages are similar to developmental stages of children. And so while each year the child grows, the parent or caregiver and family grow in their strength and lived experiences. Lastly, but important to understand the family includes the up and down arrows that you can see are around those adult life stages. And this reminds me, I hope us, of that ongoing and or intermittent grief and trauma that the families have experienced and continue to go through through the lifespan, of their lifespan and the lifespan of their child. This grief, loss, trauma, it's real. And it needs to be acknowledged in order for better health and for the well being of the family. Again, with our goal to lead the family as best they know how. I will tell you about this, the visual too, in that it's helped professionals and families in acknowledging the grief and the triggers from trauma. It also provides understanding where family is and where professionals can begin to meet where they are and value their unique journey. And what we've learned is that when families feel they're in a trusted space, relationships and collaboration happen. 
We've also learned that when connected with other families, processing their stories together, create an environment of strength and they become empowered in a way that provides the ability to regulate their emotions, to embrace their journey in a way that instills confidence to move forward and hopefully love themselves a little bit more. In listening to our families, we found that we have a, that the families have a story that not only informs others, but empowers the family. We've worked with our state deaf blind programs this past year that have family engagement coordinators to help family build their story. And this entails starting where the family is. And that's inclusive of their history, their race, values, cultural beliefs, and language. It entails having the family reflect on their highs and lows in their journey. And it entails identifying those family strengths based on what the families learned today in their journey. It entails celebrating the joy amidst the grief. And this is all set in the context of being in community with other families. Our mom presenting her story went through this process. Tiara, like I had mentioned, is a fellow board member for Family Connect. Listen as she shares her journey with her now 16-year-old son, Max. Listen to Tiara's amazing support system, her values that keep her going, and hear the evident trauma and grief expressed as she continues to create the best life for her family. As you listen to Tiara, think about how much you gained from her story. It'll be powerful. And at this point, Tiara, if you want to take yourself off of video, on video, we'll have you take it away. Hello, I am Tiara. I am Max's mother. When I was pregnant with Max, I was scared I was having a premature baby. But that later became the least of my worries. My baby was also born blind. And the initial feeling was scary because his eyes looked like marbles. People were telling me he just has a veil over his eyes and it will fall off. But I knew it was more than that. The doctor later confirmed it for me that he was blind. As you can see in the photo, Max as an infant wearing a summer outfit and the veil over his eye that I just mentioned. He initially passed the hearing test. So we did not know that he was deaf yet, but I already knew that life would be different for us. You see, Max was the first blind person I had ever met. Also, we had a big dog and I quickly noticed my baby wasn't responding to the dog's bark the way other babies were. So I started to think maybe he can't hear the dog. Once he was diagnosed with hearing loss, it was the same feeling all over again, but this time it was more intense because it was like, not only is my baby blind, but he is also deaf. I remember saying to my mother, if he can't see me and can't hear me, then how am I supposed to bond with my baby? How will he know who I am? My mother did keep reassuring me that all babies know their mom, but I was still scared sad and just depressed because everything I thought of with my baby was now different. He will never see me. He will never hear me. And I also felt guilty for feeling depressed. This was my baby, my blessing. And I couldn't be sad about it, but I was sad. I was also a little bit angry, even more so because I couldn't express any of the feelings. So I just prayed and walked by faith in my belief. It was a leap of faith to find someone who actually knew how to teach him and was able to connect with him. We would see so many specialists and therapists, but hadn't found any who actually connected with Max. There was an amazing lady who came to our home every other week for three years, but she never connected with Max. We then met Bernadette Van Den Siller, who was a deaf blind consultant from the International Deaf Blind Program. 
the first time she came to our home, she connected with him, primarily through touch. It was amazing. As you can see in the picture, Max, excuse me, as you can see in the picture, Max holding the handlebars on a bike, looking at Bernadette, smiling at her. That was the best time. She told me that he can learn. And if anybody tells me that he can't learn, it's that they can't teach him. That faith that she had in my baby and those words stuck with me through every obstacle that we faced. When I noticed that the hearing aids weren't helping his hearing, I started doing my own research and found out about cochlear implants. At first, I was angry that his hearing doctor had never told me about this as an option. But when I brought it up to the doctor, I was very excited about it. But they told me that he wasn't a candidate for it because he doesn't have an auditory nerve. I kept walking in my faith and asked for a second opinion. The doctor said it was a risk, but he would try it even though the nerve was small. Through prayer, I took the risk. Once I submitted it to the insurance, they said it was an elective surgery and wouldn't cover it. I kept believing and praying and researching. Through the International Deaf Blind Program, Max was in a movie called Touch. They wanted to provide monetary compensation, but I told them I didn't want any money, but I did just want them to help Max get a cochlear implant. They assisted with that and it turned out great. The moment that he got the implant and they were turned on, he sat straight up in the wagon and laughed, a big chuckling laugh. It was then that I knew I had made the right decision for him and his hearing. The photo is of Max's grandma and Max. Grandma, known as Beta to Max, wanted to be the first voice for Max to hear. She is holding him, smiling big, and he is responding to her. The next step in our walk was another big decision. This time it was about his eyes. He had gotten a few cornea transplants and the eyes were just clouding back up each time. This photo shows Max playing with the pumpkin, wearing an eye patch after one of his first surgeries. The doctor offered to do an artificial cornea transplant, which I hadn't heard of. I began researching and quickly realized that it seems to have an amazing success rate. People were gaining 40 to 60% vision. But also if it didn't work, Max will lose all the vision that he had and basically lose the eye. I decided to go ahead and let them do the surgery and to take the risk like I had decided with his hearing. And at first it looked perfect. His eyes were the clearest that I had ever seen them. For a while, I was fighting my fear that it might fail, but it took a long time. And then one day I noticed that it was sunk in and looked weird. I took him to the hospital and they did emergency surgery on his eye that day. The eye has been lost ever since. I felt defeated like I had made a bad decision for him because he lost the vision that he had prior to the surgery. I kind of felt like it was my fault that he was in a worse off situation than he was to begin with. I could see that Max was learning through experiences. Kings Island provided us with memories filled with Max enjoying life. This photo shows Max wearing a yellow shirt, enjoying the carousel ride like never before, responding to the movements and the sounds. The hardest time for me was when we attended an IEP meeting. I went in all jolly, happy to do the IEP, but hearing them tell me that he hadn't made any progress in six years was so sad for me. I remember I cried in that meeting, thinking and saying to them that it makes no sense that they were saying that he's still at a six month to a one year stage. That's the same stage that they said he was at six years ago. So you mean to tell me that he isn't making any progress? This told me that they were not really teaching my baby anything. I have fought to get Beth, who was a paraprofessional at the school. And then my dad fought to get intervener training, a specialized training for deaf blind. This was with no support from my district. I also work with Max day in and day out at home. So I knew he was making progress. 
I just didn't like hearing that he hadn't because I knew he had. Hearing them say that made me feel low, really low. But I realized at that point that they had saw my baby or that they were equipped to teach him. So I began searching for other educational options for him. Finding the proper placement for him educationally was another step in our walk. Knowing that the deafblind programs are limited, I quickly realized the best option for Max was Perkins School for the Blind in Boston, Massachusetts. It was the number one school on deafblind education, but he had missed so many years of education and the cost for it was far beyond my means. I kept walking by faith, praying and trying to get him in Perkins. This is a photo of Chris Armour and meeting Max for the first time. And I will explain the importance of this moment. I have become very active on the social media platform, getting out awareness about the issues we were facing. It also helps me cope with everything by sharing it and talking about it. I was trying to use it to help people who would come after us. For that social media activity, we met Chris Armour a man who was literally an angel on earth. He runs special books by special kids, interviewing special people, getting their stories out to help create awareness. Chris reached out to me and filmed the interview with my baby and it went viral, super viral. He then decided to do a fundraiser to help pay for Max to attend Perkins School. It was amazing. I just had to figure out how I was going to move. And I did what we always do. I walked in faith and moved my family to Boston, Massachusetts for this last school year where we are now. Max is in the school making so much progress. Here he is in a video at school, interacting and participating. He is actually playing kickball. Here you can see how patient the staff are while Max kicks the ball. They then support him in running the bases. I am so proud of Max and grateful to the staff and where we are today. This move to Boston has been hard, but worth it when I see the progress my baby is making. Here is a picture of myself smiling and Max laying on me. He is my light as I walk by faith. Thank you all for this opportunity to share our story. Thank you, Tiara. Thank you. So much work and so much to be able to think about as other families listen to your story. We so appreciate it. And well, thank you to APH Family Connect um, and all of you wanting to be a part of family engagement. We have a few more slides that um, are about NCDB. Um, most importantly, our resources. Again, these are all links. For those of you who may be interested, and I know that the PowerPoint will be posted on uh, Family Connect website. I think at this point, Melissa, we will um, entertain questions if anybody has any, or just simply words of encouragement for Tiara. Absolutely. I'm gonna put um, in there the slides again. And I just want to say it's been amazing to hear Tiara go through this process with Jana and the power um, of her sharing her story. And I can only hope that families and others who are listening just really hear and feel very much the passion and the excitement from Tiara's story. I just want to say thank you again for Jana and Tiara for sharing your story. Thank, thank you, you for having us. Yes, and being with us this evening.